So, Joe, this morning we look back on the week that was and what's ahead. Well, and uh, what's ahead not only for the United States, but also what's ahead for the world. I saw uh, a piece in the Financial Times this morning. Uh, many people would say a poor man's economist. Uh, <laughs> thank you so much for being with us, Andy. Uh, yes, but it, it, I, the, the, it, it, it struck my attention on uh, Francis Fukuyama talking about why exactly Donald Trump succeeded so well and why the Republicans uh, uh, swept uh, what Trump unleashed and what it means for America. Uh, but I, I thought that as you dug into it, uh, it really talked about it. And Alex, I don't know. Do we have the full screen on that or not? I have it here. Not quite yet. <laughs> not quite not, yet, not but you quite, can read it. Not, not quite yet. Well, well, it really, it went, it went to, uh, Zanny, I'll, I'll go with you here. I, there's been an ongoing problem in America that I know I'm sure you've, you've been concerned about. Yes. I've been concerned about over the past 20, 30 years, the deindustrialization of the West, what that means for those that have been scattered in the job market, uh, what it means, uh, it, the, the, the distortions uh, that it's caused to the economy, uh, whether it was, uh, well, here, it, they've actually got the prompt. Let me read this and then have you respond. Mm -hmm. uh, he writes, when Trump was first elected in 2016, it was easy to believe that the event was an aberration. He was running against a weak opponent who didn't take him seriously. And in any case, Trump didn't win the popular vote. When Biden won the White House four years later, it seemed as if things had snapped back to normal after a disastrous one-term presidency. Tuesday's vote following it, and now seems that it was the Biden presidency that was the anomaly, and that Trump is inaugurating a new era in U.S. politics and perhaps the world as a whole. Americans were voting with full knowledge of who Trump was and what he represented. But what is the underlying nature of this new phase of American history? Classical liberalism is a doctrine built around respect for the equal dignity of individuals through the rule of law that protects their rights through constitutional checks and balances on the state's ability to interfere with those rights. But over the past half century, that basic impulse underwent two great distortions. The first was rise, the rise of neoliberalism, an economic doctrine that sanctified markets and reduced the ability of governments to protect those hurt by economic change. The world got a lot richer in the aggregate, while the working class lost jobs and opportunity. Power shifted away from the places that hosted the original Industrial Revolution to Asia and other parts of the developing world. The second distortion was the rise of identity politics, or what one might call woke liberalism, in which progressive concerns for the working class was replaced by targeted protections for a narrower set of marginalized groups, racial minorities, immigrants, sexual minorities, mm -hmm. and the like. Mm -hmm. State power increasingly was used not in the service of impartial justice, but rather to promote specific social outcomes for these groups. In the meantime, labor markets were shifting into an information economy. In a world which most workers sat in front of a computer screen rather than lifted heavy objects off factory floors, women experienced a more equal footing. This transformed power within households and led to the perception of a seemingly constant celebration of female achievement. The rise of these distortions, understandings of liberalism, drove a major shift in the social basis of political power. The working class felt that the left-wing political parties were no longer defending their interests and began voting for parties of the right. Thus, the Democrats lost touch with their working class base and mm. became a party dominated by educated urban professionals. Mm -hmm. The former chose to vote Republican. And Zanny, as I was reading this, I also saw in the New York Times, I believe, a story yesterday that said uh, the 10 richest people in the world made $64 billion. Uh, what was it, Alex, last week? In, in, in an extraordinarily short amount. Okay, uh, Trump's victory adds a record $64 billion to the wealth of the richest top 10, while again, the working class get poorer and poorer. And Democrats, left of center groups, have had no answer for this now for 30 years. So it's interesting, Joe, that Frank Fukuyama wrote that piece. Uh, he, of course, was the man who 30 years ago wrote an article famously in 1989 called The End of right. History. Uh, and he thought history had finished then, and my goodness, he was wrong. And I agree with him that this is now the end of what you might call the post-war era of the world, where the American-led rules-based order is 
definitely been challenged. And you could say, as, as uh, Frank Fukuyama said, perhaps first time around it was an aberration. Now it is absolutely not. Americans have voted very clearly for a very different conception of their economy and of their role in the world. What caused it? I think he touches on many of the important points. I don't think you can put this... It's partly a backlash against the economy. It's partly a backlash against particularly the inflation of the last four years. If you look around the world, this has been a really bad year for incumbents. Incumbents have been turfed out in many countries, not just the U.S. But I do think he's also right that there is a sense in many Americans that the United, that the Democrats have lost touch with ordinary Americans. And I think the social aspect has a lot to do with that. People don't feel that the Democrats are thinking of them. They think they look down on them and they think they are the party of the elite. And that's a real problem for the Democrats. Mm. And Carlos, uh, what, importantly out of this election, what we can read into these numbers is that I think it was long believed that white working class voters were uh, by and large Trump supporters, but the coalition got so much broader over the last couple of years and it showed itself in the vote on Tuesday night with Latino Americans, 45 percent going to Donald Trump. Black young men going toward Donald Trump, not overwhelmingly, but making moves in that direction. Young voters going toward Donald Trump. This was not just about white working class voters. This was something much bigger, a much broader coalition than most people realized. That's right, Willie. And I think part of the explanation is in what Joe just read. Democrats, it's been decades since Democrats speak to this country as one nation as one American people. You know, it's always we're going to do this for the Hispanics and we're going to do this for the African Americans and we're going to do this with the LGBTQ community. And Donald Trump, you know, for all his flaws and of course a lot of his speech is objectionable, but he speaks to all Americans with the same message. And I think, you know, that that's a big explanation here. I mean, people are looking for all these policy uh, explanations. Well, which policies does Trump support that people like? It's really more about culture. It's really more about the way he addresses the country in an odd way. I think it's unifying, whereas Democrats have really kind of fractionalized the country and tried to win all these different coalitions. I think that's over. I mean, this idea that Democrats have pushed for uh, a couple decades that demography is destiny, well, we can declare the death of that. I mean, we're in a mm -hmm. new era now, and Democrats have to learn how to win in this new era. You know, uh, Mika, Frank Bruni was, uh, has also written an op-ed today that we're going to be talking about, and he also talks about what Democrats missed. And we talk about how Democrats would see the shocking things that Donald Trump would say on the campaign trail, and they would think that was going to be what made the difference. Him rambling about Hannibal Lecter, him rambling about electric boats, him rambling right. about sharks, him rambling about going after Nancy Pelosi, going after Liz Cheney, all of these other things. And what Frank Bruni said is they weren't paying attention to it. Even the big yes. things they were paying attention to, the debates, yeah. said that a, a lot of people and a lot of Democrats looked at those big media events, those big political events, thinking that that would smudge over the reality of inflation and how much right. groceries cost and how much gas cost and how hard it was to get into a home. And Frank Bruni says, Democrats never got it. That while we were looking at all of the crazy things Donald Trump was saying on the campaign trail, all of the frightening things Donald Trump was saying on the campaign trail, they were looking at their wallet. They were looking what groceries cost, what gas costs, what rent costs. And none of that really penetrated their conscious when they went to vote. Right. It's, I think, hard for a hardworking American who's busy, who's got kids, who's got a lot of things to worry about, to even take a moment to comprehend enemy from within or Hitler's generals or things that really seem very jarring to students of politics and American who do this for a living. But uh, I agree it kind of washed over because I think if those comments were taken seriously, uh, the perhaps the results might have been a little different. Um, and the comments are real. And the history with Donald Trump is real. But I don't think the Democratic side was able to m communicate that effectively or they over communicated on it as important as it was um, and left out other areas, left other areas for the Trump side to take. And